All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so my name is Antonio Mele. I'm an associate professor and lecturer here at LSC at the Department of Economics. It's great honor uh, to introduce our host today, uh, Charlie Evans, uh, the president of the Federal Reserve of Chicago. Uh, before we start, I want to mention that at 8 p.m., we're going to have a, a, a conference with journalists uh, that you guys are not entitled to stay. Um, so at the 8, at 8 p.m., you're going to have to leave the room and let the journalists do their job. Uh, but for the moment, it's it's great pleasure to have Charlie today. Um, now, he's president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago has been in this uh, uh, position from 2007. Uh, before that, he was uh, director of research and has been uh, an academic before that. Uh, has produced a lot of research that has been very influential. I was just checking Google Scholar and his most cited uh, article has about 9,000 citations. Mm -hmm. Spread good. Yeah. <laughs> He has generated a lot of research in the following years. Um, his work as researcher, as you can imagine, was mostly on monetary policy and its effects, uh, nominal rigidities, monetary policy and its effects. Uh, I will say, um, I feel a little bit like a groupie that needs one of his uh, intellectual, uh, intellectual, uh, I want to say lights, because this, in particular, this article that I'm talking about, uh, about nominal rigidity, the effect of monetary shocks, uh, has been studied by all the students in economics from when it came out, which was in the 90s, I think, more or less. In 2005. 2005 was published, but it was, it was still oh, collecting the report, yeah. right? 1998. Long was, past the publication. It was on NBR much before that. Right. I'm pretty sure. Yes, it was. Right. Um, now, what we're going to do today is a QA. Uh, we're going to start with a moderated QA, which we have some questions that have been prepared for Charlie. Some of them are from the online audience, and some of them are from you guys. And then we're going to give uh, the opportunity to students that are present to ask questions, all right? So I'm gonna ask you kind of a personal question. What made you, uh, so the question is, what, what was your motivation in joining the Chicago Fed when you did? Right, right, so uh, thanks very much. It's really, um, really a, a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be here speaking. Few, uh, you know, students are, are a great forum uh, for having a conversation like this. This particular question, you know, why did I go to the Chicago Fed? I uh, did my undergraduate at the University of Virginia. I worked for a couple of years, then I went to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. You know, I, I'm going to guess, Antonio, you went to graduate school, you got a PhD. Most everybody says, oh, I want to be a university professor. I'd like to be an esteemed, distinguished university professor, but I want to be at a university. So my first job was at the University of South Carolina. Uh, about three years after into that, my advisor, uh, Professor Marty Eichenbaum, uh, called me and said there was an opening at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, he had moved to Northwestern, and um, that's also in the Chicago area, and he was going down to the bank where they have a research department. And I had the opportunity uh, to get a position there. And it's like, well, instead of teaching and doing research at a university, I would do policy analysis and research. And I had a lot of time to do research. And uh, Marty Eichenbaum was there. Um, uh, very soon, Larry Cristiano was there. Those are my two co-authors on this uh, really, really nice paper. If you ever have a chance to read it, I would read the abstract at least. Um, I can recommend it seven years in the making, um, but anyway, that's a different seminar we'll talk about. Um, but, you know, we it was just a very productive environment and uh, being able to advise the president of the bank, who was a member of the Federal Open Market Committee, much like the Monetary Policy Committee here at the Bank of England. And, um, you know, it just opened up opportunities, opened up ideas on what to work on and so uh, very productive time. And then I was fortunate enough to um, 
Oh, I did a little management lightly, which is sort of a curse. When they find out you're good at that, they ask you to do more. And so I became research director. And then I was lucky enough to be made president 15 years ago. So from policy advising to being a policy um, advisor to maker um, on the FOMC. So it's really been a wonderful opportunity. And, um, you know, going to graduate school, getting, you know, a PhD. I know I was attracted, you probably are too. It's, it's rather entrepreneurial. You get to choose what you want to work yeah. on. You're, you could decide to work on something differently. Your colleagues may or may not like that if they hired you because of your expertise. But, you know, you can, you can change what your interests are and you market it to other economists. And that's part of the job is convincing them that you've got a good idea that they should be paying attention to. And so, um, you know, it's really good. And at the Reserve Bank in Chicago, they maintain that culture and it's really been, you know, productive. And um, I'm happy to say that our economic staff in the time I've been pres president, so I don't hire them anymore, but we've maintained that culture and really have a, a really good uh, group. Have you ever been to Chicago? Not to the Chicago Fed. No, you should come to but Chicago I have sometime. Some friends there. Yes, that's good. Very good. Very good. Um, that's great. Uh, do you miss anything from the academic life, actually? That's Sorry? my question. Do you miss anything from the academic life? Um, you know, so I only spent three years, you know, as an assistant professor. I've done a little teaching on the side. I, I was... Uh, do you miss teaching? Um, you know, it has its moments where I do. Uh, there's a sense in which I enjoy teaching, communicating what we're doing. Um, I don't enjoy the um, assessment side of that and, you know, all of that. I mean, who does, right? So, but uh, sharing what I know and hearing what other reactions are is an important part of what we do. I mean, after all, you know, we, we you know, during difficult times when inflation is high, we raise interest rates and that causes a lot of pain, you know, for the economy. And you better be able to explain why this has a value proposition uh, for the longer term when you're, uh, making it difficult for households and, and businesses. And so it's, you know, that's part of the communications. Another question is about your day-to-day -day responsibility, how they look like. Yeah, this is a hard question because my day-to-day mm -hmm. -day is just, it's different every day. I mean, when I'm getting ready to go to Washington for an FOMC meeting, I'm pretty much working on that, um, you know, that week um, and, and longer. And so, you know, but then there are other you know, times where um, our bank supervisory staff, they have some issues. And so I meet with them uh, to get up to speed on financial instability risks and, and things like that. So that can be part of it too. There's the research, the policy, understanding, formulating policy decisions, uh, positions, um, understanding financial instability risk and thinking about the banks in our five state district. Um, we have, uh, we must have 1,800 banks. Well, that's a big number, isn't it, Kathy? In our district that we so we're somehow- under, We're under 1,000 now. Yeah, but we have a lot of uh, community, small yeah. banks, mm -hmm. and then we have some larger banks, and um, we also have the um, um, uh, some exchanges to um, CCPs and all that. So there's interesting work there. Um, you know, I'm the chief executive officer of the bank. I have a chief operating officer. We, we, you know, we're partners in helping run the bank. We've got an executive management team. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, people in, uh, in um, uh, departments that, you know, we, we want to work together and collaborate and share the best uh, thinking there. So making sure that we've got the right management team, that's important. Making sure that our staff has uh, development opportunities. Leadership is an important aspect. And, you know, trying to make sure that everybody has professional opportunities so they can advance in the bank. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that um, we're as uh, careful and uh, we're doing the best job that we can in order to recruit the most talented, diverse uh, talent that, that we can. We really benefit uh, from that. And so uh, just a whole bunch of issues that, that we have to deal with. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I might do one, not the other, but over the course of a month, I'm engaged in all of those things from, you know, executive management, the supervision to um, monitor policy. 60 degrees kind of charge. Yeah. yeah. Right. Managerial reserve. I mean, there is a lot going on. Right. Um, so this, this question is, I think it's particularly interesting also for me. So the, the, the question is about, given that you served since 2007, can you briefly describe how different the monetary response was 
in the financial crisis and in 2020. Cool. Right, so, you know, in the time that I've been with the bank, uh, 1991, um, oh gosh, let's see, I remember 1992, from a distance, um, somebody described this, when, you know, when the Bank of England had to, you know, uh, go off the, 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 the exchange yeah. uh, rate mechanism in Italy too. too yeah. The other day I was listening to somebody from Italy describing all the challenges that they have and, and the lending. And I remember in the old days, you know, depreciating currency was part of the response mechanism, sort of right-sized their debts, although it came at, at quite a cost. Uh, we went through that. Um, in the late 90s, there was a tremendous increase in productivity in the United States, durable goods productivity, and we had a great run in the economy from 95 to 2005, and just had uh, uh, very strong growth, very strong uh, productivity. That led to certain monetary policy challenges with the uh, dot-com uh, bust, the run-up in the stock market, you know, and things like that. 9-11, uh, the aftermath of that, you know, uh, horrible terrorist action and what that uh, inflicted on the United States and, and the world through the um, uh, war in Iraq and other um, issues. Um, by the time I became president in 2007, I kind of thought I was pretty prepared. You know, I've got a good background. I do research on how monetary policy affects the economy, how you might think about fixing it. I've got this cool dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model that we published, and it kind of provides good intuition for how I should think about a lot of stuff. And then the great financial crisis hits and it's uh, uh, a lot of embedded leverage and derivative products that nobody really appreciated, understood that well. Um, if you are, I always find if you're interested in monetary policy, if you are interested in some of these case studies, these examples, and as I think back on the housing crisis in the United States. Back in 2005, the FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee, had a meeting, June of 2005. There's a transcript, you can read this. And the question was, is there a housing bubble? Are prices are high, prices are rent, sort of like a price dividend ratio, um, which ought to give you an idea if they're fairly valued. You know, they're kind of high. But you know, who says that these houses, houses shouldn't be you know, higher. Maybe that's a market. It is a market price. Maybe it's okay. But what if it's not? What if it's not? What if there's a crisis? What if, and the scenario goes, what if there's a national fall in housing prices of 20%? 20% is a big number. Nationally, never happened before in the United States. This is a big what if question. And you kind of go, well, that would be pretty big. That would be a problem. Now, these mortgages, people wouldn't pay their mortgages. Well, banks would you know, end up having people defaulting on their mortgages. Well, how much would that hurt? <clears throat> it turns out that banks hold capital. They hold capital against losses. And it turns out that, you look at it, they had a good amount of capital. You know, 93% of the banks in the banking system would pretty much be okay. There'd be struggles elsewhere. That's before we even talk about how monetary policy can respond by reducing interest rates and making things a little bit easily. And, and the ultimate assessment at that meeting was, it's probably something that we would get through, there'd be a recession, but we'd respond, you know, and it might not even be too high. Now you get to 2007 and you kind of go, oh, I didn't know they had that embedded leverage in those uh, derivative products. Um, I didn't know that everybody was lever you know, le levering up more on making those bets and other kinds of things. So the great financial crisis hits, and it's kind of the thing that Ben Bernanke was the chair of the Federal Reserve because he had studied the Great Depression. So we had a huge recession in the U.S. Now, the U.S. is ahead of everybody else. I also remember as I talk to people here, um, policymakers, and it's kind of like, yeah, in Europe, things began in about 2010, but that's a different story completely. Um, but I mean, it was a struggle for everybody. But but Ben Bernanke understood that you know the financial system was going to struggle, and we needed a whole bunch of liquidity programs to help. Uh, after all, businesses were kind of saying, "I can't make my payroll." It's not because I don't have the funds; they're in commercial paper, because nobody has them barren, not earning interest. But the commercial paper market is not functioning, so I can't access my funds. And I can't pay people. And opening up those um, markets as quickly as we could was was a big deal. But having said that, 
the banks lost a lot of capital. They were challenged. They struggled to make loans, and we had a very slow recovery. But the answer there was monetary policy was important. We had to really be aggressive and do that. Now, in 2020, we had a totally different outcome with COVID, the pandemic. Oh, I can only guess how many times you've been here in the university. You're right in that period where you know we were shut down, you know, at the bank and the office, and you know we we, we couldn't be together. Now we can be together, so it, it's much better. But um, in the U.S., around the world, we kind of went home, shut things down for a while, tried to figure things out, brought the economy back. Businesses came back slowly in different ways. Um, we used the playbook that we developed in 2008 under Bernanke's leadership and, and the committee. Um, so that was available, but it just went on a long time. I mean, it was just different. And so um, we did have a quick recovery in goods, but gosh, the things that we've seen, all of a sudden households switch from goods and services, in-person services, going to diners, going to a movie, to goods production. So, you know, we overloaded on goods production and that stress capacity and all kinds of issues. We still had accommodated monetary policy. That's a similarity, 2000, 2008, 2020, accommodated monetary policy. Now we've got inflation, though, and the supply shocks that came from rebounding economy, reduced supply because labor force still is kind of uncomfortable coming back in some places. People are fatigued. Uh, businesses are at capacity. So we've got you know, inflation and we need to address that. And it's partly big supply shocks and partly demand is outstripped the current reduced aggregate supply. So some similarities, but some differences. This last part, people kind of go, well, this is like the 70s. <laughs> Fortunately, you're all too young to remember the 70s, but you could be historians and you, you know, read about it. But uh, you know, that was a period where you know, the supply shocks were really challenging. Oil prices were very high. And monetary policy just wasn't quite as good or on the ball, you know, back then. And they kind of allowed inflation to get out of hand more and more and more. So a lesson from that is we don't want to revisit that. And, you know, every central bank is increasing rates to address the high inflation now. We didn't have to do that during the 2008 period. It was quite the opposite. We had to get inflation up. So they're kind of different. I felt like I was prepared. Undoubtedly, my background helped an awful lot, but I've learned an awful lot during this time period too. It was quite challenging for, for a while. I would say also, I'd like to say to my students that uh, the, being a macroeconomist software is like being in a zombie apocalypse. You never know what is going to happen next. Uh, you need to be prepared to anything. A zombie is going to jump on you. Uh, it felt a little bit like that for about 20 years now. Uh, I have a question about... Um, the Evans rule. Um, someone would like to know um, the rationale behind the Evans rule. Maybe we, exp we can explain what it is. Sure. The rationale behind and uh, its successes. So, so just to, to, to start back with the 2008 Great Financial Crisis, and so we um, we lowered interest rates to zero, basically the effective lower bound. Um, in December of 2008, and we we knew that we still needed to provide more accommodation, and interest rates were at zero. Nobody contemplated negative interest rates, and even though um, you know European Central Bank, um, other banks have had negative interest rates, they've been only a little bit negative, like minus three quarters of a point is a big negative, yeah. and and we really needed like minus five percent of additional accommodation in order to get the economy going. So that wasn't gonna happen. So, um, you know, again, Ben Bernanke, um, understanding financial markets and the um, how they work with the macro economy um, said, well, let's buy assets. Um, that's like, he doesn't like calling it printing money. It's a little bit like printing money. You're creating reserves. Um, you're easing credit conditions. Uh, he preferred to describe it that way. One way or another, I balance sheet got uh, much larger that provided accommodation. Uh, March 2009, we announced that we were going to purchase one and three quarters trillion dollars of assets over the next year, which is an enormous number at that time. We've done more since then. Um, by 
by late 2009 and into 2010, people were kind of going, I think, I think we're getting out of this. Ben said, oh, I see green shoots, the economy's coming back. And in the first part of 2010, it's kind of like people started going, we don't need all this accommodation. When do we get to raise rates? And I'm kind of going, mm, I don't know. Second part of 2010, this is not going well. It's not coming back. Inflation is still low. We need to do, to do more. Um, late 2010, we did QE2, quantitative easy, in the second version, where we said we were going to buy $600 billion. Get into 2011. Things are going better. Oh, we don't need to do all this. We can start raising rates. In fact, the committee got so excited about that, we published uh, exit principles for getting out of asset purchases and all of this. By the summer of 2011, no, this isn't going very well. Inflation's very low. Unemployment is still 9%. And in my opinion, and so we were criticized for buying assets. And so we ended up doing the, let's sell the short end of the yield of our portfolio and buy the long end maturity expansion program. And we were able to provide accommodation in the same way without increasing our balance sheet. We just increased duration by quite a lot. Right, all these students know about duration. You know, you, you earn more money when you come out if you know about duration and finance and all. Isn't that still true? Anyway, it's still true. okay. Anyway, um, so uh, by September of 2011, I kind of said, you know, our problem is we keep saying we're tired of accommodated policy and low interest rates, and so markets keep pricing in higher interest rates. These higher interest rates are stepping on the accommodation that we need. And so we need somehow to say, we are going to be in this for quite some time. And so I started saying, we need to announce that we will not be increasing interest rates before the unemployment rate goes below, we ended up saying six and a half percent. It was 9%. So clearly we're not gonna raise rates until we get lower unemployment, six and a half. Unless, unless inflation rises above two and a half percent. So it's a very risk um, I, it's kind of conservative in the way that it looked at it. It, it, it kind of said, we're going to continue to do this until we see success on the real economy measured by six and a half percent unemployment. But I could be wrong and maybe things are going to come back. And the measure of that would be if inflation goes above two and a half percent. At that time, it was one and a half percent. So if inflation comes back, then all bets are off and we can raise rates. Um, we didn't raise rates until 2015 because things kept happening. And um, we kind of, but unemployment started coming down. And so we sort of, once we adopted what you're referring to as the Evans rule, thank you, uh, threshold base for guidance, um, things began to improve then more sustainably and unemployment fell below six and a half percent within a year. And we were able to take that out, but it still wasn't time to raise the funds rate. But mm -hmm. that, that's a way of using thresholds to kind of say, we're not going to make a move until these conditions are met. All right. So another, I think another very interesting question is about quantitative easing. Um, so some economists have argued that quantitative easing has contributed to the increase in inequality and has allowed debt levels to rise significantly. Um, how effective do you think quantitative easing was? And what would you say to the, the critics of quantitative easing? I, I, there are, I've already mentioned that, um, you know, in the situation after the great financial crisis, when the economy was still not good, unemployment was 9%, um, that we needed to provide more accommodation but because interest rates, the policy rate was at zero, we had to do something else and we chose to buy assets. So that's quantitative easing. It is the case that as we buy long duration assets, that has an effect of taking duration out of the hands of investors. They have funds given back to them and now they have to put the funds somewhere else. And when they put the funds somewhere else, it helps other parts of the economy. That's sort of the idea. It's a portfolio balance effect. It lowers long-term rates by some amount, people have quantified it, you know, but anyway, you, you can try to quantify that. There's going to be a lot of uncertainty. It sort of depends on a whole host of assumptions like preferred habitat, which is people really wanted that 10-year treasury. And now that you take that out of their hands, what are they going to do? They're putting it somewhere else. 
and they're not just going to kind of remove everything around so they're back happy the way they were without having an effect. Um, it certainly shows that you're committed to continuing accommodation. I think the singling effect is very important. But one way or another, broadly speaking, quantitative easing is just another way of cutting interest rates. It's another way of providing accommodation. So I would say that the real force of this question is, when you provide a lot of accommodation and you lower interest rates, is that somehow privileging certain sectors of the economy? Is it driving up equity prices uh, and things like that? Well, I mean, a simple answer is, Equity prices are present value discounted, future cash flows discounting at a lower interest rate is going to increase uh, that value. So certainly that is the case. But it's also the case that you're lowering borrowing costs for households who might otherwise not decide to buy a durable good, make an expenditure buy a house if mortgage rates are like that too. And so you're trying to move some future consumption expenditures from the future into the current period where you need it a lot. And that benefits everybody. It benefits businesses and people choosing, you know, to work, lowering unemployment, um, you know, but it, it does, you know, benefit asset values to, to some extent and, and associated property values and things like that. It disadvantages uh, savers who are looking for safe savings. I think of it as passbook savings on, you um, on um, on your bank account or savings account. So it does that. But of course, I think those savers are better off if the economy moves to a better economy where you have real rates that are, are a lot better. Um, so getting the economy going, living with our dual mandate where we're supposed to sort max, support maximum employment and price stability is what we're after. And, and that's what we're doing with our tools. Yes. yes. Uh, since you mentioned the dual mandate, uh, was there any consideration by your FOMC to advise fiscal policy makers to aggressively target 6.5% unemployment? Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because the second point, as I thought about this a little bit, I had a second part of this, which is the other reason why um, we end up going to the lower bound and Back in 2011 in the United States, there were elections the previous year. Um, the, op uh, the opposition party at that time, the Republicans, took over in the House of Representatives. And, you know, in the U.S., you know, we've got an annual budget that has to be approved. They end up basically just doing a consolidated one vote for everything kind of thing. But they, they said, mm, we don't think we should approve a budget unless you do, and then whatever the political agenda is. So it was used for sort of a game of chicken. Another aspect is for reasons that escape me, once Congress and the president have agreed to spend, and if they don't have enough tax revenue, well, then you have to borrow, you run a deficit. And I would think that the act of approving the expenditures would be enough to do that. But we also have another law, which is, well, the government debt can't exceed a certain number. It's the debt ceiling. And so when you hit the debt ceiling, it's got to be increased. Well, if you don't increase the debt ceiling, then all of a sudden you can't make payments on you know, certain loans. So we entered a period of austerity, and I think in, 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 in the UK, the government chose that and, and you know, around the world. Um, long-winded way of getting, if the fiscal authorities had supported more aggregate demand at a time where the economy had high unemployment, that would have helped get the economy going in a way that perhaps we wouldn't have had to have interest rates lower for as long as they were. Unemployment could have gone down, inflation would have picked up towards our target, and we could have gotten out of the effective lower bound sooner. So the, the coordination of fiscal, so I used a bad word there because we don't coordinate. But if, if all policymakers have in mind, you know, the best economy that they can help support, given all their other objectives, um, you know, then that can support more effective monetary policy that's not so, um, so extreme. And we wouldn't have to increase our balance sheet as much as we have done, because we wouldn't have had to do quantitative easing. All right. So... I'm going to move to some of the questions that we received from the online audience. Yeah. Um, so we have Edward James from Imperial College that is asking, 
it is a little bit tricky, but I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask it anyway. Do you support a Fed rate hike prior to the November meeting? <laughs> oh, you know, I don't talk about things like that, right? It, now, it, it is it is interesting. In the time that I've been at the bank, there used to be two pieces of advice, which were mandates, which is, as an economist going out and speaking in public, there are two questions you don't answer. What are interest rates going to do or when do you raise them? The other one is, what do you think about the value of the dollar and should action be taken to change that? The answer to that also includes the dollar is the province of the treasury secretary and she is in charge of that and we don't talk about that. And we always hope that the treasury secretary doesn't say things about what the interest rate should be. Now, what's interesting is since then, we talking about where interest rates are going has become an active tool of policy or guidance. So um, I, I would, um, the, the, the question is so careful and specific, I can't answer it. Um, if the question is sort of like, where are interest rates headed in the US? I would say we published our summary of economic projections just uh, last week. And um, a very large part of our 19 member uh, committee submitted projections that assumed that the federal funds rate next year would increase to uh, four and a half to four and three quarters. The median of 19, 19 participants said it would be four and, three, four and a half to four and three quarters. And if you kind of look at the general pattern, I think it's pretty clear that everybody has in mind a continued increase until we get to that point. I'd say like March, 2023, we'll be at that point. And the clustering, of those, I said the median, but the clustering is so narrow. It, it's really, it, it's it's pretty much um, a consensus view on that. But next meeting, no, I can't say anything. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I have a question about the UK, actually. I'm not sure if you can comment on that. that what, what do you think about the UK mini budget and the falling pounds? And how do you think the Bank of England should respond in this situation in the last part? Um, I, I, you know, I can't really um, address that either. Um, I'm, I'm just a guest here. Um, I would, I, I would say that um, in the U.S., if you listen to commentary and the criticism of where we are, um, inflation is high. It's much too high, and it's, uh, you know, fair game for critics to sort of say, "Geez, the Fed should have started way before March. Didn't they know inflation was getting out of hand?" Um, you know, at that time, the April 2021 FOMC statement mentioned that we are seeing elevated price increases in some segments. Used car prices went up 10% in one month. That's, that's one month rate, not annualized. The next month, they went up 7%. And then the next month, they went up 10%. It has a very small weight as a component of the CPI, but a small weight against a really big number, and then you annualize it, that you know that, that ends up having a, a big effect. New cars, they weren't making them because of the chip shortages. Durable goods uh, were also in short supply for the same thing. Furniture, um, a whole host, 15% of the core CPI basket increased by 20% um, as of February, 2022. But sort of before that, we kind of thought this, and we said transitory. We said this is going to be transitory, and then they're going to come down. Okay, well, now that's a derogatory term, you know? I mean, I shouldn't have said <laughs> transitory. It's been more persistent. I don't think it's permanent. Um, but we, 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 we've we ended up increasing interest rates quite expeditiously. Uh, we have increased interest rates in the U.S. by 300 basis points in seven months, which is extraordinary. And um, when I said in the U.S., if you heard this commentary, you would kind of hear that it's a U.S. problem, but it's really a global inflation problem. So, I mean, here in the U.K., inflation is high. Energy prices are high. In Europe, inflation is high. Um, around the world, in, uh, inflation is much higher. Oh, in Japan, who, that's had a woeful experience trying to get inflation up, it's not nearly as high, but it is more elevated. And in Switzerland, for some reason, it's really as high, but of course, they have a history of lower um, inflation on average, and it's still going up. So central banks around the world are in the middle of this interest, rising interest rate environment. And like I say, it, it, it's worldwide with 
interesting, difficult variations on top of that, like national get, natural gas prices have increased by a factor of seven here, I believe, and you know, in Europe, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and all of the ugly economic sanctions, uh, responses to sanctions that have been taking place with regard to uh, energy and other things. It's just made it a really horrible environment. And it's, it's supply driven, but a concern for monetary policy is that it's very persistent and it gets into in inflation expectations. That's when it would be really difficult for us. So uh, I think we're gonna open to questions from the audience. Do we need a microphone for that? I know. All right. One here. Um, thank you, Mr. Vance, for the speech. Um, so you mentioned about fall guidance in your first question. And I was just wondering, like yesterday in your FOMC speech, you mentioned about the terminal rate um, in the US going to reach around 4.5% and like rate hikes going to like continue into 2023, which sounds like fall guidance to me, but I'm not exactly sure. So. But meanwhile, I saw that a lot of like central banks in the UK, in the EU, also the Fed is sort of like taking this meeting to meeting approach, I guess, this year, starting from this year. So I was just wondering, does that like sort of meeting to meeting approach suggest that actually central banks are retreating from this idea for guidance because it's not really credible in a way because no one knows what's really upcoming next. And I just want to know like, what's your opinion on like effectiveness for guidance? And is that going to be like a temporary retreat from this or is it permanent? Right, so um, yes, very well stated. So the, the challenge for policymakers when it comes to forward guidance is now why do I have to offer forward guidance? Anybody who's paying attention, now they're not necessarily as technical as you might be, and as I'm going to try to describe this, but in the policy environment, and you kind of go, I'm supposed to be delivering maximum employment and price stability. Sometimes there's a little bit of a trade-off, but sometimes they are very well aligned as if it's a divine uh, coincidence. And so um, if uh, unemployment is high, inflation is usually too low, so providing more accommodation is the right thing to do. So since everybody knows what I'm supposed to do, I've been doing it for a while, they might be able to understand my reaction to where we are, they'll figure it out. So why do I have to do forward guidance? On top of that, if I decide I do need to do forward guidance, it's usually against that reaction function. Because all of those smart people who are looking at the normal reaction function are kind of going, this is about the time they should be raising rates. Think about what I said relative to the threshold-based forward guidance and the committee in 2010, 2011 going, oh, it's time to raise rates. You need to sort of say, this is different. It's a different uh, policy. And you, you want to commit the committee to that. Committing the committee to something that they will later regret is not something easy to explain or convince people to accept. And that's part of why policymakers will kind of go, I don't want to do forward guidance anymore because I shouldn't have to do that. And every time I've done it, I haven't liked it because it, it made me take an action that I didn't like. Even if it ended up in a better outcome, that still went against what I'm thinking. Now, you mentioned, um, you know, I, I referred to the summary of economic projections. And so that is my, me and my colleagues showing our work. I would say this is showing our work for our projection. I have a forecast that says inflation is going to be 2.8%, 3.1% next year. Why? Well, partly because of my policy projection. Um, yeah, some people don't like to show their work because it's, you know, not the easiest thing in the world. But once you see that, it's an indicator of where the committee thinks it's going. It's not forward guidance, but it is forward guidance. You see, it's not the, I'm telling you in a statement that this is what we're gonna do, but I'm kind of showing you that if you're paying attention, that's kind of where we're going. So I would say the SEP is forward guidance, but in a way that some policymakers would go, well, that's okay, but I'm not saying that's how it's definitely gonna be. There have been times in our policy statements where we've been very prescriptive. We're not going to do anything. We, we do not expect. We never say we won't, but we always say we do not expect that we will have to do that 
until these conditions are met. And in September of 2020, we are very prescriptive that we were gonna wait quite a while until inflation got up to averaging 2% and we we're at maximum employment. And as we got closer to that, it was kind of like, oh, it depends on what I mean by maximum employment. Things are getting better and inflation's going up and all of that. So that's part of what's going on. All right, back there. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming to speak with us. I had a question uh, about in 2020, the Fed adopts the flexible average inflation targeting. Uh, I'm assuming that was in part because of the experiences in the, in the 2010s. But how did that impact the response to once we start to see higher inflation, in the four or five percent, which I believe under the prior framework would have been a lot more alarming? Did this new like approach uh, like make the response be significantly later, or or right. do you not think it had that big of an impact? Right, right. Um, yes, I can tell you've done your research on this question because you're citing that we adopted flexible average inflation targeting. Many, many people describe what we came up with in 2020 as flexible inflation targeting, flexible average inflation targeting. We actually never say that's what we're doing. Um, we had discussions about what if we did adopt that? What would it look like? And you can see response rules and you have alternatives to that. And, you know, at the end of the day, the Federal Open Market Committee did not say that we we're doing flexible average inflation targeting. Now, we did say that, you know, our objective is price stability. We interpret that as averaging 2% over time on average, on average, but, and also inflation expectations, which are consistent with 2%. We did more explicitly point to, if there's a period where we have been underrunning our inflation objective for a period of time, we would be willing to overshoot 2% in order to average, and then we're kind of vague about the wording there over time. It doesn't explicitly say flexible average, flexible average inflation targeting, although we do say average and it does have that in there. Um, you have to fill in so many more details in order to kind of say, well, what would flexible average inflation targeting be? But we have those elements to it for sure. And that is part of what the angst was, um, you know, in, in, in 2021 when inflation started going up, because after all, we were kind of expecting to be facing a situation where the Trump administration had cut taxes. They probably didn't consider well the implications of the tariff war that they started that led to a little slowdown, well, slowdown around the world um, and a manufacturing recession in the US. Nobody contemplated COVID, but we were kind of expecting that the economy would get better, hit full employment and put pressure on resources. So inflation would be going up and up slowly according to the Phillips curve. Instead, it leaped up because of these supply shocks, semiconductor shocks, labor force shortages and things like that. And next thing you know, we're talking about 8%. And it's kind of like, we don't have to talk about averaging 8% into these other numbers because this is just you know, unacceptable. So the circumstances just changed so quickly that, um, you know, we're, we're faced with a different situation. If we ever found ourselves back, you know, around 2% and not subject to supply shocks, it, some of the things you're talking about might be more relevant. Right here. Professor, I had a question. I read an article by Paul Krugman in the New York Times where he was describing that perhaps why he was wrong about inflation was because his view of the Phillips curve was wrong, that it wasn't a linear relationship. Instead, it was kinked, and the slope changes as you get closer to full employment. Would you, what, what would you say in this case? Um, so, I mean, it's... Um, So the challenge with inflation and talking about inflation is um, it's extraordinarily difficult to get somebody you're having a conversation with who's a little bit critical or whatever to say, I want to go, what's your model of inflation determination? 
I mean, I, I've told you how I think about it. It is a Phillips curve. It's got special factors. It's got transitory factors in it. This is the Janet Yellen uh, Phillips curve going back to 2014. Mm, actually, probably going back to 2012 because she was also a supporter of threshold for guidance and her comments couldn't say exactly that, but it was related to that. Um, and it's kind of like, well, it's going to depend on Slack. It's going to depend on special factors. Relative prices can change, supply shock, and the persistence of that would be important. International factors would be another fact. Inflation expectations are really important. Now, as a side note, in the 70s, there was an accelerationist view of the Phillips curve where every time inflation went up, it sort of stayed there and you built that into it. With inflation expectations being anchored and the Phillips curve being flat, it's really inflation expectations are there. So I got slack and I got inflation expectations. And unless inflation expectations go up, it's not going to contribute you know, to that. Um, but after I explain that and people are critical, I kind of go, what's your theory? So Paul Krugman's very good at that. And he, he's offering up a theory. And it's a Phillips curve, but it's kind of like, it doesn't seem as if it's as flat as it used to be. Back in 2019 and before, we would have a discussion about exactly this because the inflation rate, uh, unemployment rate was 3.7%. The inflation rate had increased to 2%, but wasn't more than that. And people were saying, I think the inflation, uh, the Phillips curve might be kinked at three and a half. When we hit three and a half, and if we go further, inflation's going to be more because you can't get it out of the models. You, you do the linear model. What's it mean to drive in, inflation? Uh, sorry, I keep saying I'm doing that. Unemployment down to 3%. Not a lot for inflation. But if you got a kink, you go up. There's a big deal. If it's a non-accelerationist Phillips curve, it's, it's inflation goes up steeply as resources become more scarce, but it comes down steeply as you loosen up. Um, as opposed to accelerationists would be, you go up and then you kind of stay up until you do something else. We're in a different environment now. It's clearly steeper in a weird way. Um, so I agree with Krugman, but then it comes down to details. I've heard a lot of business people talk about how there are labor shortages. They can't find workers. Um, and um, if, you, if you go outside metropolitan areas into small market areas, rural areas, exurb areas, where manufacturers set up, in these communities, it's often the case that the size of the workforce is well matched with the number of business entities. And so unemployment can be 2% there, and, and they, they work fine. People stay there. They like where they live. And they might change jobs among the community, but they sort of stay there. Now, that same model doesn't work the same way. Some of them have gotten jobs from West Coast firms. If you've been working from home, if you've been in a digital environment, you might be working in Iowa somewhere, but, but live in Iowa, you could work for Amazon. So that's a change. That's gonna lead to higher wages, that can lead to higher price pressures, that type of thing. Um, it's also the case that people are fatigued. People uh, don't necessarily want to work overtime the way that they did before. So the model that worked before might not work again. This is showing up in more expensive parts to original equipment manufacturers, car companies, and things like that. And those are higher prices. And so we're seeing higher prices coming from those labor shortages for a given unemployment rate that we didn't see before. That's an example of a steeper Phillips curve. If that works its way out, that, that'll flatten out again. So that's part of the way that the supply response could flatten out the Phillips curve. You have to have a discussion about your inflation determination mechanism to make sense of this and evaluate somebody's argument. When somebody just goes, that Biden fiscal package was too much and infrastructure is too much and the economy is going to overheat and we're going to get a lot of inflation. And it's kind of like, maybe, could you tell me more about that inflation mechanism? Because that was that flat Phillips curve that didn't work before Before we had supply challenges, those earlier arguments came about. So it, it's very complicated. And if you're not willing to show your work, I don't see how, how you have a good conversation. Uh, all the questions. These have been you're... terrific questions. Yeah. When you actually have a target pet fund rate, how do you decide on how much to raise in each meeting? So you basically see the results of each rate hike. And on average, 12 to 18 months. 
So how do you decide like in several months you raise 300 basis points? But like it could have been 100 basis more points in three months and then see the impacts more clearly and then just act accordingly. Yeah, it's um, um, as economists with a lot of training with, you know, anal analysis in our hands, uh, statistics, estimation methods, modeling. It makes a lot of sense that we try to put a lot of precision on something like that, right? You've got a reaction function. I've got a target. I got a little model. It looks to me like I need to increase it by this amount within this time period. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about all of that, of course. So, you know, that, that analysis helps inform policymakers, but policymakers also get analyses where it's kind of like, suppose um, we, we had a lot of discussion about this before when we were trying to get inflation up and we had interest rates low. And it's kind of like, should we keep interest rates low for a long period of time, see inflation go up and then steeply increase the funds rate? Or should we start gradually increasing the funds rate? Because it is still going to be accommodated monetary policy as long as the federal funds rate isn't at the neutral rate. It'll just be a little less accommodative along the way. And you look at the analyses comparing those and it doesn't really make a lot of difference in the model. You know, if you if you do it really quickly, I'm sorry, if, if, if you do it for a long time and wait, or if you do it gradually, you kind of got the same outcome because Phillips curve's not that steep and things like that. So in the current environment, you have elements of the same thing, which is inflation is high. I know I need a more restrictive stance in monetary policy. Should I front load? Should I try to make improvements right away and get closer? Because we're starting at zero in the US and most everybody did, and you know. Or can I take my time? Um, well, so one, one thing constant in all of those analyses are there's a restrictive setting of your policy rate, inflation adjusted, so it's a real rate that ought to impart the appropriate amount of restrictiveness for households, businesses, investors that would bring inflation down. So there's a level that you're going after, and then the question is how fast do you have to get there? Um, you know, I think when you're really behind and getting started, and I'd say in the US we were behind, so we tried to front load. And so we wanted to get closer, this is my own interpretation of what we're doing. We wanted to get closer um, to not being really wrong and overly accommodative. But once you get up to a certain point, it's like, are you fighting a credibility problem? Is it that the finan financial markets and everybody else don't believe what you're doing? And so you have to continually do more in order to convince them you're in it to win it, that you're going to do it. If you've got full credibility, if you've got inflation expectations roughly in line with your ultimate objective, even though inflation is higher, you could imagine stretching out the increase so that you could see the data come in and evaluate a little bit more, as opposed to having to take a bit of a risk, which is, I know I have, I think I have to go up this high, I'm going to get there really quickly, and then I'll, I'll sit. That might be relatively equivalent. The risk is, I go up, and then I get a piece of bad news that I think people don't believe me anymore, I have to do more. And it's that overshooting risk that how do you balance those choices. It's uh, there, one way or another, discretion in art comes into this, it seems. We do not have a policy rule that has covered a broad enough set of scenarios like we're facing now, or we have faced in the last 15 and 20 years that I would put a lot of faith in all by itself. All right, I think we have to get to a close. So I would like to thank our, our guest here, Charlie. Thank you very Thank much you. for your answers. Thank you for coming. I would like to thank the organizers, uh, team and his team. Team and his team. Okay. Didn't work out very well. Thank you very much for organizing. It's really great being here. And, and I'm glad that uh, for whatever procrastinating reason, I never did this by video when I was uh, 
asked earlier. I'm happy that I could be here in person. So nice to see everybody. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we're going to vacate the room for the press conference. I think I'm going to ask. Yeah, 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 I'm going to ask. Yeah